a canon is... This is news to me. When was it composed and why? That's their own fault. I've got no sympathy. Hello, welcome back to another episode of Two in a Bar. I'm Chris. I'm Joe. And today we are going to be diving into another composer, another piece of music. We're going for Packle Bell's Canon in D. This piece is, is so famous, isn't it? So popular, so well known. Yeah, I, be, I believe cellists are a big fan. The cellists are a big fan, we'll get to that in a sec. But yeah, it's, it's so, so well known. And yet, I don't know about you, Joe, but I know, or un, until doing a bit of research for this, mm. I don't know anything about Packle Bell. As a person, composer, anything else by him? What about you? I'm very keen to learn. I think I might know a few things, but already I'm thinking that's a gross overstatement. Um, well, we'll jump into it. So yeah. um, as per usual, we'll tell you what we're going to be talking about. And I'll put the timestamps in the description, along with links to any pieces of music we talk about, including this one. We're going to be talking a little bit about Packle Bell and his life. A bit mm-hmm. of the context around this piece, Canon in D. A bit about the music, there's lots to talk about. And then some talking about my uh, dance music remix of this one. I think we should. Nice. So jumping right into it, Packlebell, Johann Packlebell, was born in 1653 and died in 1706. So Mm. we can say straight away this puts him in the middle Baroque period. Yeah. So for people not immediately familiar with the Baroque period... It's a period of, we're going to be talking about the music, but it does apply to, you know, architecture and other other uh, areas of culture as well. But Music's in, normally the last to follow, isn't it? In terms of like literature, art, architecture, then music. That's it. But in the case of music, very roughly, it's the dates around about 1600 up until about 1750. Mm. Uh, the most well-known composers from this period, I'd say, are Bach and Handel, though they tend to be a bit later in the period. Yeah, a lot of people and can't the, handle the that. The style of music, key features of it, along with the architecture as well, is, is very ornate, lots of embellishments, ornaments, decorations. Yeah, lovely. I, I, very beautiful music, isn't it? You know, counterpoint, things like that. Yeah, um, for sure, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about um, when we're talking about this, this music, counterpoint. Um, so Packelbelt was a German composer and organist born in Nuremberg, and during his lifetime, he worked his, his whole life as a composer, uh, he was incredibly popular, very, very, very popular composer indeed, and organist. This is news to me, because one of the one things I was going to say is I learned at school that Packerbell was a one-hit wonder. I mean, I think everyone can probably guess why, but interesting that he wasn't <laughs> that during his lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so very, very, very popular. The South German organ school, he's credited with, you know, really advancing that, the style, the kinds of ways that they dealt with counterpoint, which... Okay, let's, let's crack into it straight away. So, so counterpoint, traditionally, um, when you're dealing with music, a standard way of writing it might be to have melody or a tune and an accompaniment, right? So it might be chords, might be a bass line. With counterpoint, you'll have more than one melody going on at the same point, and they interact with each other in different ways. So there's like there's two different things, or two or more different things going on. So that's what counterpoint is, right? Almost like a round, isn't it? You know, you, you could almost describe a round a bit like that. Yeah, it's it's, it's more like a conversation um, mm. rather than one person talking and everybody else agreeing with it. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, he was born in Nuremberg. His dad was a wine dealer. And at school, he was very gifted, both academically and in music. And Mind he, of anyone. <laughs> he worked a lot of different places in Germany. And he also worked in Vienna, obviously in Austria, and built his reputation so much from these uh, positions that eventually he came back to work in Nuremberg and that they were clamouring for him to return as, as, you know, the big conquering celebrity of music. This is absolute news to me, by the way. Uh, um, yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, so he's best known as an organ composer, wrote more than 200 pieces of, of music for it, mostly mm. for, you know, the churches or um, court positions he held that required new music for every Sunday. And um, one of the 
<laughs> things that jumped out to me in the research is uh, one of the one of his compositional jobs, the tasks that he was uh, you know, given, was um, you'll have to correct me on my pronunciation of this. Erfurt in Germany. Erfurt, probably. Erfurt. Yeah. Yeah. So when he worked in Erfurt, part of his job was to write one large scale work per year. Obviously, in addition to all of the, the usual things, but one particular part of it was one large scale work, lots of instruments, voices, etc. And the main criteria of it was that each one had to be better than last year's one to show nice. his development as a composer. What do you think about yeah. that? Because that's a lot of pressure. It's also quite hard to quantify that, isn't it? Yeah. You know, wh- what determines it being better than last year? Yeah, or who? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, so the canon in D, when was it composed and why? Well, nobody knows. It must have been surely that that was his final piece, right? Because it didn't oh, get better yeah. than that for him. So that must have been his, <laughs> his, his pinnacle, the apex of his you know, compositional career. No, I don't think it was particularly well known uh, during his lifetime. It's just, you know, been wow. discovered since and then made popular uh, for mm. various reasons. We'll talk about another section. So, yeah, no, nobody knows when it was composed. There's lots of guesses, lots of speculation. Um, and nobody knows why it was composed because um, he didn't really write relatively to how much organ, church music, uh, that much chamber music at all. So originally this would be for three violins and uh, basso continuo. So, you know cello or harpsichord yeah, interesting interesting and not not because i thought you were going to say that it was originally written for organ because and no. it is but would you say probably it's most frequently performed by string quartet two violins yeah, exactly, viola exactly. and cello yeah interesting yeah which which isn't a million miles away from what it was written for originally yeah 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 as musical tastes changed as the baroque period came to an end and things moved on. Packle Bell was almost completely forgotten about after his death and after the Baroque yeah. period, despite being such a celebrity in his lifetime. And um, as was, you know, a fair amount of Baroque music. And it wasn't until actually... Bach himself even was a bit forgotten. Yeah, yeah, and until, until the later revivals. But, but, you know, but Bach kind of stayed the course of time a bit more than Packle Bell, I'd say. Well, a lot more. Mm, because, mm-hmm. you know... Other composers used Bach as studies, didn't they? You know, that the well-tempered clavier and things like that. Yeah. That's yeah. a few. But it wasn't until the mid-20th century that Packledell was really rediscovered. And that was because of the... Have you heard of the authentic performance movement? Not at all. Oh, you will have done, for sure, for sure. The authentic performance, performance movement. So I'm going to tell you what I think this is. Go on then. Where people... We'll look at works, let's say, from, you know, Packable's time, let's say the 1680s, I'm going to pick that decade, and I'll say, we want to perform this piece, and we want to perform it. Yeah, we want to perform it with with instruments that were used at the time. Yeah. Maybe even wearing wigs. Brilliant. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Tell me I'm wrong, Chris. No, you're not wrong. I was just surprised you're not heard of this i don't mean this in a patronizing way but just because it was you know such a big thing Mm. at the time mid 20th century it became all the rage for it's historically informed performance so you've got you know old style instruments that they're putting gut strings on violins wooden flutes getting the harpsichords back out all of this kind of thing Mm. straight away i'm just gonna say i'm not a fan (laughs) for anyone wondering not joe's bag no, I bad. Why would you do that when you've improved the sound of things? So I understand every now and then you might think, oh, I wonder what that would have been like at the time. Yeah, great. Don't overdo it because obviously, you know, they don't use sheep guts anymore for things like that. And there's a reason because they sound a lot better. I, I'm with you. I mean, with, with the flutes, I think it'd be quite fun for about five minutes. I probably yeah. I hate for this, but I think it'd be quite mm. fun to try for a novelty. But after that, it's just oh, that this is a lot harder to play and makes a worse sound than my yeah. instrument, which has gone through centuries of development to make it better, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. No. I, I think one thing to understand, though, is that the way music was performed before that mm. would be to play everything, including, you know, a Beethoven symphony, as if it were a Mahler symphony. So, so very, very, yeah. very romanticised, 
very, very, very heavy on the vibrato for, for everything. And so this was almost as a reaction to that. Yeah, yeah. No, I get that. So anyway, um, in this movement of looking back at the past and digging out these pieces and performing them, Packlebell was rediscovered. And in particular, in 1968, the Jean-Francois Payard ensemble made a very famous recording of Packlebell's canon, which really launched it as an enormously uh-huh. famous piece. No, I didn't I didn't know this. This is interesting. So this is what sparked you think is massive popularity in one day. Yeah, and, and ironically, this particular recording, they didn't play it in the historically informed performance way. They played it very slowly in a romantic style, and that's what people latched onto rather than the traditional Baroque. Funny that. <laughs> I, lo- I love baroque music i do love baroque music but i do think yeah and and then since then it was it, it really really built up in popularity used in films uh it became a traditional wedding piece um one one of the reasons i mean it's it's nice isn't it everyone knows it but but also we're going to talk about the music in a second but it's very repetitive but it's repetitive to an extent that you can kind of end it anywhere mm. because because it goes in these repeated cycles. So whenever the bride, you know, gets gets to the altar, you can just yeah. stop it. It's yeah. Convenient. It's also yeah. the the baseline itself, right, is representative of almost obviously it's not quite, but so many pop songs, right? Is it follows the same pattern almost as you know, so so many pop songs. It's it's nice to listen to, isn't it? It's comforting for the ear. So jumping in to talk about the music, um, first of all, a canon is a contrapuntal piece. So contrapuntal counterpoint, we talked about earlier, you know, different melodies happening at the same point rather than, you know, a melody and accompaniment. Um, But the key thing about the canon is it's imitative. So it's not two different melodies. It will be one instrument or part, could, could be voice, could be whatever, plays the melody. And then another part plays that melody again, either directly or slightly differently, whilst the original part does something else. And then when the second part has done its first melody, it then copies what the first part does second. And then another part comes in and copies all this and it builds up like that. So like you said earlier, um, it is a bit like a round. So a round, like like your row, row, row your boat or Frere Jacques, uh, that would be a canon with identical repetitions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's also um, this particular canon, so canon in D, that people always say, oh, Packlebell canon in D. It, it's like it's to differentiate it from other canons, but I'm, I'm sure he did write other canons, but I don't think most people, I'm certainly not, are familiar with them. I can't name a single other piece he wrote. So canon in D, this one, <laughs> it's also quite like a chacon or ground bass because... It's not a strict canon in the sense of all of the parts imitate each other because we have these three violins that are copying each other. Um, and underneath that, we have the ground bass, which is the famous cello line you referred to earlier, where the cello part or basso continuo part, whatever, does the same bass line all the way through. And, and this is like a, a chacon or a passacai, passacalia. Yes, yeah. And part of this repeating bass line, which um, cellists love to play, they don't, mm. they, they hate it because it's very repetitive. I think uh, it's 28 times that the same bass line comes in the whole thing. That's a pro- I thought you were going to say more than that, actually. That's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's quite slow, though, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Yeah, and so on. I'm not- but like you said earlier, like pop music, which tends to be, you know, quite often the same chords played through with different things over the top. It's very similar to this. And and then the chords that are formed by the bass line here and the chords that you make over the top of them, really similar to a lot of pop songs to the pop, to the point where this has been referred to Canon D as the godfather of pop music. Do you think it is? Do you think we can say that? I'm going to ask you about this in a sec because I've got a couple of thoughts on this. Yeah. Okay. But um, one thing I didn't realise was, because I thought the thing was like, because a, a, a lot of people go, oh yeah, can- canon, Paco Bell canon. It's, you know, just like pop music. I assumed what people meant by that was that it just happens that a lot of pop songs follow the same 
chord sequence. But actually, from looking into it, there have been a lot of pop songs that have deliberately taken the same chord sequence and then made the song from that because it was so mm. popular and because they like the they like the chord sequence. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I think I think it's probably overstated, particularly as if you what you're saying about it not being popular again till the mid 20th century. Yeah. I think it's probably a little bit overstated. I think I think it's just a nice pleasing girl. And also I think a lot of the pop songs they didn't follow quite the same chord sequence, do they? That's what I was going to ask you. So because obviously um I, you know, make make dance music. I teach piano as well where I spend a lot of time with people saying I want to learn XYZ song pop song and so we you know work it out work out the chords a a lot of pop songs you can boil down can't you to chord one chord four chord five chord six in whatever particular key we're in yeah yeah Yeah. but Paco Balcanon um I've not got the sheet music in front of me but you know off the top of my head it goes D A B minor F sharp minor before it does the chord um, three G G D G A so so it's actually throwing in chord three which isn't that you? It's, it's not. It's not like off the chain, is it? But but it's but it's not. You know, standard standard, right? I yeah, I completely agree. And it's and it's chord three in the minor, which is where it should be. If it were chord three in the ma- in the major, we could call it the Oasis chord, as I like to call it, the Noel Gallagher chord. But it isn't that. So yeah, it's just a, it makes it a little bit more unusual, which is why I think it's too simple to say. Oh, it's the father of pop music, whatever, or the godfather of pop music. Godfather. Um, yeah. so you should mention Oasis. Uh, don't look back in anger. Very similar to this chord sequence. It, yeah, because that does use chord three in the minor. You know. Yeah. And then, but then in the chorus, it uses it in the major again. That's yeah, where it's yeah, different. Yeah, so, so, so that's the difference. But yeah, yeah. Some would say it's even better than Packable. Great tune. <laughs> yeah. And anything before we move on to talking about some some other stuff? Anything you want to know on that? I think I no. I think it's because I genuinely quite interesting how you said about i never really thought about why it's so popular for weddings because it's not a wedding march you know you hear if you've attended many weddings as i have many many to sing at them you know you hear lots of things like the you know the trumpet voluntary um is it jeremiah clark i think it might be i thought it was handle mm. but it isn't or that a lot of handles music things like that and they're specifically designed for wedding like mendelssohn's wedding march but interesting about how one of the reasons you said it's so good is because it it can almost stop at any point, can't it? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, though. Um, part of it being popular at weddings is that the royal wedding in the UK, uh, I think it was Charles and Diana. Ah. Um, they, they, did, they didn't play this, but they played some of the Baroque music. I can't tell you what it is off the top of my head. Um, and that really popularised Baroque pieces in America and places like this, because, you know, it was, you know, the fairy tale royal wedding. Oh, they play Baroque music. What Baroque music do we like? Oh, this is popular at the moment. Packle Bell Cannon. Let's go for that. Could we so also say, as a, as a, if you are a string quartet, you know, a member yep. of a string quartet, would we say it's not that tricky to play? Like, it's, it's going to be a very, very standard one, the repertoire. Like, obviously, for the cello, it's not difficult at all. And I know <laughs> in the, you know, violin one, you've got the da 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 but um, I think it violin one sounds... and two and three. Thank you, Joe. Given it's a canon and they of imitate course. each other. Well, you know, but impressive though it sounds. I don't think it's actually that tricky to play, is it? No, I don't think so. It's yeah, so nice it's, it's a, yeah, and it's a, it's a nice one to have in the repertoire. And then if you were to, you know, if you needed someone, someone said, oh, we, "We want a string quartet at our wedding." Do you have any suggestions? Well, that's there on a the plate, isn't it for you? Yeah, I, I've played it at weddings. Then there you go. There you go. On what? Uh, flute, mate. Flute. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so on to my Tropical House remix of Packle Bell's Canon. Have you listened to it? Of course. Nice. And any thoughts, first of all? I've actually, Chris, listened to it, as many may know, being a primary school teacher. I've listened to this with my class. Have you actually? I actually have. The, nice. They... They enjoyed it. Were very, very confused by the tropical theme. Yeah, I think they're more confused by the picture on Spotify. Very enjoyable listen. Okay, again, uh, picture highly recommend. Like the beach hut, I think. Is that top yeah, top? it is. Yeah, yeah. It didn't. It didn't compute the idea of the baroque counterpoint. Although obviously it's not the same <laughs> in your on your remix with the with the beach. I think it works beautifully though. Oh, thanks, mate. Yeah. So this one, like we 
I talked about briefly in the previous podcast about Mozart. I did this remake and Mozart's Rondo alla Turca in the same month. And I did, honestly, I spent a lot more time on the Mozart one than this. I just kind of, I, I, I did like want to make this good. And I, I went through it really thoroughly. And the, and the version I released was probably like draft seven or something like that. Like I, I did put time into it. But compared to the Mozart, not so much. And then this one, it's just been. It's just got so many more streams than any other of my remixes, and it's the same on every platform as well. Give us numbers. Give us. Give us data. Um, I, I know this is like you know small fry to a lot of people, but uh, mm. YouTube fifty five thousand, Spotify five thousand. Nice, nice. Yeah, but 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 it's, it's it's not just you know YouTube, and it's like oh maybe it, the algorithm happens to pick it up on YouTube or anything like that. It's it's every platform. It's this remix, the Packledale Cannon one. It's the one the one yeah so i mean you could look at that and say oh, i did, did a really good job of that but you know in reality is, is it just that you know mm. people like people like Paco mm. yeah yeah they, they do love it don't they they do love it would you say uh that it lends itself nicely to a remix like this hugely so yeah definitely yeah more more so than some of the others you've done yeah well, well i didn't have to change the the harmonies because they're there yeah. and they're pre-made pop music style yeah 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 it's yeah. good it's funny you should um say about talking about it to your class it's, it's because it's the most listened to it's obviously the one that's had the most comments on youtube uh by a long way and uh one person commented on it saying that they were set homework to listen to it and analyze it which is quite cool that's great that's awesome yeah. that's um, what we need chris get on the music curriculum now <laughs> that's it um but because it's so it's it's done comparatively, you know, pretty well compared to my other remixes. Like, um, I'm, I'm really grateful for all of the listeners that all my remixes have had, and you know, they've all done reasonably well. But but this one has just been, you know, different level compared to the others. Um, I'm actually at the moment working on a new version of it. Is that right? That is right. I thought, you know, jump jump on the bandwagon of that. Give us give us a couple of like you know tastes of it. Give give us a, a couple of nuggets of information. Right. So, I mean, one of the main things about it is it was about, you know, a year ago I did this now. So hopefully I'd like to think I'm a year better at producing now. So, so when I listen back to this one, there's loads of things in it where it's like, ah, oh, could have done that better. That could be done better. I wouldn't do yeah. that now. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so so there's things I'd like to improve. But but also I'm it's going to follow a slightly different structure. Yeah. Good. I'm looking forward to it already. Nice. Right. So, um, as with our previous episode, we're trying to keep general chit chat and chat chatting rubbish to more to the end of the podcast than to the beginning. So we can be a bit snappily on point with our music chat. <laughs> so people know but, when to leave. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so if you've made it this far again, thanks very much. Well done. Bravo. Congrats. You've reached the point where we're just going to. <laughs> go off topic a lot yeah uh, so one thing i did want to share with you you know at some point when we've had a lot of people comments and things like that a lot of interaction um i want to read out comments on our podcasts and you know give a bit of heckling because i'm sure we'll get yeah. Heckling too. yeah but but we're not yet at that kind of that kind of level but what Shame. i can do in the meantime is on youtube analytics you can see what people have searched for <laughs> that led to them finding the podcast. So I thought I'd share a few, a few with you and get your thoughts Amazing. on those. Amazing. Okay. Um, okay. Two males podcast. <laughs> I mean, whoever searched that has listened right to the end, haven't they? That's, Do you think look, we didn't, Chris, we didn't disappoint. I was going to say, do you think they found what they were looking for? Yeah. Well, look at the criteria. Two males in a podcast. What more do you need? Uh, trombone podcast. Ooh, that's in... One, could that have been me searching for that? I like that. <laughs> you searching for it. Well, you know, searching for a trombone podcast. You know, not enough of them. Well, I mean, the, the trombone has been briefly mentioned in a couple of yeah. episodes. But yeah. I think calling it a trombone podcast would be a, maybe a stretch too far. Yeah, and maybe optimistic if you searched that and then clicked on it. <laughs> um, okay, a few other ones. Classical music, I have never. 
So you know the drinking game, never have I ever. People are searching Brilliant. that in relation to classical music. Brilliant. Yeah. Why this comes up, don't know. Yeah. How are people uh, playing that in relation to classical music? I've no idea. Maybe it's a thing. Never have I ever conducted a symphony by Tchaikovsky. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to drink to that, wouldn't I? Cause... You would have to drink, yeah. Whereas I, I certainly wouldn't. <laughs> you could be the person, Chris, who during the game says things to impress other people. <laughs> oh, there's, there's no. always somebody doing that whenever you play. That's the problem with that game, isn't there? Never have I ever had a standing ovation at a concert I was conducting. Oh God. <laughs> Oh, that's oh, me. Let just, me just, just guzzle me, this it? down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, other, other things people Whoops. have searched for. Baywatch. Not Baywatch, but just, just Baywatch. That makes sense. Yeah, that's the first one I'm not surprised by. But if you're typing in Baywatch into YouTube, presumably you're looking for an episode of Baywatch. Baywatch? Baywatch. Not two guys talking about music, briefly mentioning Baywatch at part. I think we could have been on Baywatch. Didn't you used to be a lifeguard? Um, I was a life-saving teacher. It's different. You, you know, someone's got to teach the lifeguards at Baywatch. <laughs> okay, other things. Um, right, what do you think people will have made of listening to this, having typed in podcast episode? Nice. That's their own fault. I've got no sympathy. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, even person typing in Baywatch, you've got, maybe they clicked on the wrong thing. Someone who's searching for a podcast episode... I've got no sympathy whatsoever. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 it's like walking into central London and saying tube station. You know, I, it's worse than that, actually, isn't it? it I, I've got no sympathy whatsoever. It's like going into the Sahara and saying sand, you know. <laughs> there we go. Well, thanks a lot for listening. Check back in next time. Uh, next time it's going to be your turn to pick a piece. What are you thinking of doing? Uh, possibly For Elise by Ludwig van Beethoven. Oh, nice, 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 nice. You know, I'm a big fan. You could almost say that I'm Ludwig fan, Beethoven. So on that note, I think we'll call it a day there. <laughs> Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>